this cloud and we are rolling in terms of recording and uh give me the heads up guys let me know when you want me to let Excuse everyone me. when it says record does that mean it will be available on youtube or yes oh. so we record the lecture judy and then we uh put it on our youtube channel our hunter mfa uh channel so the hunter zooms are on youtube yes what in terms of the, the artist lecture series yes Oh, great. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yeah, for sure. And we give all credit to, to yourself and Stanley. Say hi to Stanley, of course, by the way. <laughs> and we should let them in. Um, there are 30 people waiting. We ready? Yep. Three, two, one. C'est parti. Wow. 38 participants. Shall we uh, mute ourselves now? Yep. Okay. Bye, Judy. Bye. <laughs> wow, there's Team Lom. Larry. <laughs> oh, so nice. <laughs> Tim. Marie. Hello. <laughs> Beautiful to see you. <laughs> Twenty some years later, right? Wow, <laughs> oh, it's touching. <laughs> nice to see you, Marie. Wow. Um, Hi, everyone. We, we are going to wait three more minutes for uh, people to gather and then we'll start. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, while people are still arriving. It's so nice for me to see Tim, who uh, was a dear friend from Hunter at the same time. And uh, we're still in there. <laughs> It's getting very dark in New York. It's really strange. It's uh, 4.05 and since we've been um, sitting here, there's an ominous arrival, Marie. I think yeah. it's gonna get, yeah, stormy and windy and drama and good, good, you know. Do you have a whole film crew behind you throwing wind and ventilators? I've and got the wind machine all right. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you like that sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of spooky. How are you, Neri? Oh, good, good. Marie, yeah. good seeing you. Thank you. You must, it's what, around 10 o'clock there now? Yeah. I'm it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> 10 o'clock. Good seeing you. Looking forward Me to too. Me too. <laughs> hey, Constance. Hey, Neri. I didn't get to say farewell. Oh, no, no, no. Never farewell. You <laughs> <laughs> Until later. Yeah, see you later. <laughs> <Have a seat>. <laughs> <laughs> we have a long standing plan for that date. That I know. You stood me up. You stood me up, Constance. Oh, the you said. <laughs> I never, <laughs> never. <laughs> but you know what I mean. We, we yeah, have, yeah. we have, we have a Something days. to look forward to. Yeah. Another thing. It's fun to see you. <laughs> Same here. Same here. Yeah, you are next to an amazing piece. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. my, that's, it's too heavy to move. And so I just leave it on the wall. It's my Zoom backdrop. <laughs> it's a big, yeah. my, so it's really he super heavy. Very provocative. Yeah, there's bullet holes above your head. It's actually breathing holes, but yeah, yeah. It could be seen as bullet holes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> what what holes? What holes, uh, Nari? Uh, yeah. It's a cosmogram. It's a, a Congolese cosmogram. It says breathing holes. Oh wow! It's something I saw in a church in Savannah, in Savannah Georgia. Um, oh, wow. this is the base of the church, which used to be a site of the Underground Railroad, and they had these holes for for the uh, enslaved oh, wow. people to to breathe. So I sort of made a piece to emulate that. Whoa, whoa. Anyway, no, 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 we're here to yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about <laughs> Why are you beginning? Can we start? I think we should start. And yeah. people will still gather. Uh, and uh, I'll repeat this uh, a bit later, but like uh, um, people who are kind of in the audience uh, can actually ask uh, while the conversation is going uh, questions and put them on the chat and we'll, we'll look at them and, and uh, 
at some point there will be some window of uh, uh, opportunity to actually maybe address some of them or we'll see how the conversation goes. But um, so I'll, I'll first do a quick introduction uh, to get this started. And uh, so good afternoon. My name is Daniel Boshkov and I'm an associate professor of art in new genres at the Department of Art and Art History at Hunter College. Um, I'm feeling particularly kind of elated today, I must say that I, uh, we're gathered to celebrate the work of an amazing artist and uh, more especially catch a glimpse of uh, a, a current basically that flows between two artists, a dialogue and a connection that makes being artists possible. I believe. And I want to welcome Maria Lossier to Hunter College as our Zabar visiting artist. Um, and actually, it would be more accurate to say welcome back, Marie, mm -hmm. since uh, uh, Marie is one of our uh, illustrious alumni. Uh, so welcome back. Thank you. Uh, um, but before I introduce Marie and uh, also Constant de Jong uh, a bit more formally, um, um, who are going to be in conversation with each other today, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Judy and Stanley Zabar. Uh, Judy is here, she, she'll be uh, uh, seeing the conversation. And uh, I wanna say that the Zabars have been steadfast supporters of the art department, the art library, and the students and the faculty throughout Hunter College. The Zaber Visiting Artists Program brings internationally recognized artists, painters, sculptors, perform uh, performance artists, photographers, and filmmakers like Marie to Hunter to work directly with the students in the MFA Studio Art Program in seminars, workshops, and uh, kind of individual studios. For the next three months in the course of the semester, Marie Lossier is going to be meeting and talking with students about their work in the individual studio visits. Uh, so Judy and Stanley's gift has made these visits possible and has ensured that such an experience will continue for our MFA students for years to come. Thank you, Judy. So uh, for the last two weeks, we were given the chance to be immersed in Marie Lossier's films. And I might say, I'm inundated with the characters she brings us to in a very close, intimate proximity. Using camera movements, syncopated edits, richly fragmented sound, but most importantly, deep empathy and understanding of the work. Marie is able to create an uncanny corridor, or uh, some kind of a wormhole through which we are not only able to encounter very closely an American avant-garde artist, a German experimental musician, or a Mexican luchador, um, but also have the experience as if we are making the work with her. It is a great pleasure to actually watch Marie Lucie's films one at a time, and then in a row <laughs> with no time in between. Uh, because watching her film, I was learning how to play the goddamn violin slowly and tunefully as Tony Conrad for 26 minutes and 56 seconds. I felt the broken parts of my body, together with the therapy of wrestling, becoming Cassandra the Exotico for 74 minutes. And I was uh, the pandrogenous being that Genesis P. Orich and Lady J built together. And then switch back in being both Tony Conrad and Genesis in what might be arguably one of the most intoxicating, intoxicating violin duo in the world of avant-garde music. Um, all this led by Marie's less or more visible hand, camera, voice, and sometimes on-camera appearance. Thank you, Marie. Thank uh, you, Daniel. That's an amazing introduction. <laughs> and, um, well, uh, and yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and yeah, 
thank you, Constance, also for the privilege of hearing you engage in conversation with each other together. Uh, and I'll just read uh, very quickly some more uh, kind of like formal uh, uh, specific things that need to be said about both artists. Uh, Marie Lossier is born in France and is a filmmaker and curator who has worked in New York for 20 years. She studied literature in the University of Nanterre, France, and fine arts at Hunter College in New York City. She has made a number of film portraits of avant-garde directors, musicians, mm -hmm. composers, such as the Kutcher brothers, Guy Madden, Richard Foreman, Tony Conrad, Genesis P. Orich, Alan Vega, and Felix Cuban. Her first feature film was the portrait of the pioneering musician Genesis Brad P. Orich of Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV and their partner, Lady J. The ballad of Genesis and Lady J won the Caligari and the Teddy Awards mm. um, at the Berlin Festival. She also has won grand prizes uh, uh, at Indy Lisboa, the Prix uh, Louis Marcopel, and the Prix de Bibliothèque in Cinema du Réau, and many more. Marie Lucie's films are regularly shown at prestigious art and film festivals and museums, such as the Berlinale Rotterdam Film Festival, Tribeca Film Festival, Tate Modern, Museum of Modern Art, Palais de Tokyo, Centre Georges Pompidou, and Cinémathèque Française. She was included in 2006 Whitney Biennial in New York, and in 2018, Marie Lucier had a mid-career retrospective at MoMA, featuring work made over the previous 15 years, and celebrating the addition of Lucier's films at the museum's collection. Constance de Jong, is a New York-based artist, writer, and performer, producing fiction writings and language image-based work for performance, audio, and video installations, audio objects, and user-navigated digital formats. Her first book, Modern Love, originally published by uh, Standard Editions and Dorothea Tanning, sorry, in 1977, was reissued in March March 2017 by Primary Information and Ugly Duckling Press. Um, for over four decades, Constance de Jong, a person of language, has made daring original forays into intersections of the formal avant-garde and experimental prose writing, multimedia spoken text works, and user-navigated digital project. Constant de Jong work has been presented at the Renaissance Society in Chicago, the Walker Art Museum, Minneapolis, the Wexner Center, Columbus, Ohio, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and in New York at the Kitchen Threadwathing Space, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Deer Center for the Arts. Um, last thing, um, and not uh, should not be last, but she composed the libretto for the Philip Glass Opera Satya Graha, wow. which, has, which has been uh, staged at opera houses around the world, including Metropolitan Opera in New York, the Netherlands National Opera in Rotterdam, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So with this introductory notes, I don't want to take more time, and I just want to pass it to uh, uh, Marie and Constance to uh, start their conversation and presentation. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. After such introduction, it's hard to start. <laughs> well, I want to say one word before we start. I want to thank you so much for hosting me, the Zebar and Hunter, Daniel, Carlos, everyone who hosted and welcomed me, but also, and mainly, I want to thank very deeply Constance de Jean, who is a very, very important um, inspiration and mentor and friend and wonderful artist in my life. So I'm very happy to find Constance, who um, I met more than 20 years ago <laughs> at Hunter College and who is still in my life very dearly and still continues to inspire many of you. Some of you had class with her and you're very lucky. And now she's not teaching anymore, but still doing her art. And I'm very, very glad, Constance, to uh, spend the night talking with you also. 
it's very touching <laughs> to find you around. So, uh, um, I know I, I'm supposed to uh, start, so I just start. Okay? Or you want to say something? I don't know if you can hear me. I can. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, 20 years, my God. <laughs> um, and we're still children. Um, <laughs> Life is a game. <laughs> um, it's, um, I would like you to, to, to just start because you're our guest and, um, and you know, you can, you, it, it's your stage and the stage is yours and please, you know, be with us as you want to be. Okay. Well, it's, it's a little bit intimidating. I have to find my rhythm because all I see is a screen and it's 10 p.m. French time and I'm not in New York and I miss you all. And um, I look forward to meet all the students also individually and their work. So that's a very exciting part for me also at the Zebar. So what I'll start is um, maybe when I came to New York because I came to Hunter directly and I was, um, I was only 19, 20 and I uh, got a grant. I was learning, um, I was really learning. I was uh, at Nanterre, a university in France which was specialized in American literature. But I, what I was really obsessed with was more than literature was film. Um, and to go through film, I thought that was not made for me and I had never had any education in the art because in France, um, when you study one thing, you don't have the choice of choosing other options, which I knew New York had and American universities. And I got a grant to do an exchange and the exchange was with Hunter College in New York City. I came for one year and it was an uh, undergrad. I had equivalents and I never left. And that's when I learned uh, completely on my own at the beginning, uh, drawing and many different other I just jumped into the art in that way and I got into the MFA at Hunter and I never left New York for 20 years. So that was the beautiful jump was really thanks to Hunter at the beginning. But um, I was always obsessed with um, film in a sense that I thought in a way New York was linked with music and film to me since I was a kid with all the American, um, the Westerns, the musicals, the silent films, the slapsticks, the music of the Velvet Underground, uh, the music of Lou Reed, of Alan Vega, all these different things that I was obsessed as a French person living in my country. And then there I was, and I had to meet something else. And slowly <laughs> it came back to me after many years at Hunter, but I registered first in the MFA as a painter, and that's where I started. But um, I almost got failed at Hunter, <laughs> and I had the chance to meet Constance, who had just arrived not long ago teaching as a visiting artist in, in Hunter. And to me, that was a, almost like the first step of her, almost like a first film. It was to encounter. Um, someone who was able to show me in a way that there was another level of life, which was through sounds. And I remember the first encounter with Constance was Constance showing us some video of Vito Acconci and Tony Asler and Joe Gibbons, who were filmed with artists who were speaking to the camera using sound to create some kind of also a performance where suddenly um, making art through video and making films with music and sounds was a possibility that I had never thought could happen. And in a way that really, really, really opened my mind and really opened my curiosity. And at the same time that I was discovering all this work with Constance, she kind of pushed me um, to discover this. <laughs> that there was video and performance and that's something I had never been in touch with and slowly I left uh, also I was working on the side also to pay for my studies 
And um, I encountered, um, I was looking for a cine club. The idea of cine club was the place where I could make friends. I didn't know many people. And where also I could see films and maybe something in the back of my mind, maybe one day make films. But the fact that there was Hunter and working with Constance slowly on the side, um, and I became part of two cinema that were very important to me and a real uh, also um, experience of learning art in the way that it, it was very important to link it with Hunter was Ocularis and Robert Beck Memorial Cinema. And the, um, the artists who inhabited those two places, those two cinemas were Bradley Arrows, uh, Peg, there was invited um, Joel Schlemovich, Bruce um, Kaspar Strake, many people that slowly showed me that there was also another kind of cinema that I had never been in touch with, which was the underground avant-garde cinema. And I started to learn the link between um, this kind of world where artists were mixing music, poetry, writing, drawing, paintings, making films. And um, at the end, they were all making films, a lot of them. And I think um, this brought back to Hunter a lot of questioning about the, the, the painting choices I had made at the time. And I had this studio at Hunter on 41st Street, which I adored. Um, but I would use it, maybe I don't know where I'm going, but I'm mixing everything, but I'll just plug it. I was also at the same time working um, to make the props and the set for a very important theater director who is still making work and who is now making films, uh, but who was at the time making one play every year, whose name is Richard Foreman. He had um, the, the theater that is at St. Mark's Place. And every year he would um, have one play and his theater was to me to make his props and work with his props. And his, um, he was a revelation to me because he was one of the artists to link sound to cassette tapes, to editing of sounds, to performance, to put lightning in the, uh, the lighting on the stage was put in the eyes of the audience. He was in the audience controlling the sound, controlling the actors. It kind of opened my mind also about what it was that movie, theater, sound, everything was connected in a way that I had never expected. And um, making the props for Richard was a way to bring the props at Hunter and making work there and bringing some of the actors of Richard Foreman in the studio at Hunter to make work with them. And when I worked with Constance at the end of the MFA, um, I was able to do my thesis show with Constance. And what we came up with at the time, which was very important, maybe Carlos, we can show some of the, the uh, photograph of the number four, for example. Um, they were the, the I, I, um, I built a movie theater at the end of uh, one of the, ah, that's the Kuchar. Um, Number four, here. Um, here you see Marlon Brando and me as Lula Nazarov. I had invented a character called Lula Nazarov, who was a silent film actress who never aged. She would be the same from silent film to the 70s with the film of Ingmar Bergman, The Touch Retouch, which I think you had to see in a bunch of films that were sent to you. And the excitement for me was that I could in, um, invoke uh, friends to write fake letters, to find uh, old papers that they could, uh, from anthology film archive, from people's archives that had history. And on it, with typewriters, with handwriting, even my friend Bradley Eros wrote one, they could invent my history. She could have been the lover of Marlon Brando, or there was another one and I don't have it there, but the girlfriend of Jimi Hendrix. Um, I could rewrite her whole history. She never is. She could play in porn film, two films of Ingmar Bergman. So there was a whole gallery of photographs, uh, like in the old movie theater, of this uh, actress 
who was involved in the history of cinema. And then I made my first films, which were, I would take um, old films that I adore, like Joan of Arc by Carl Dreyer. And I would take off the character of Joan of Arc and become Joan of Arc. So I would burn on the stick. And all this was done with zero money, just in my bedroom. Um, with a pair of socks stuck to my head to do like as if I had no hair. Um, done with a tiny movie camera that someone had lent me from Hunter. And then we would be editing and it was really, really hard. At the time, Constance could got us into this room of TV editing in Hunter where we had cassette tapes this big like Betacam and we had to edit in a way that was insane. It was like, you cannot go backwards. You can only go forward. You, so you had to learn about editing and thinking in a way that was like, I would never do it again. But it taught me later on when I touched film, actual celluloid, that when you cut film, you can't decide that you don't want to cut it. That's how I learned editing in a way. Um, and by replacing myself into films, I did the Broken Blossom, another silent film, uh, by, um, I'm having a blank, but I, I play Lillian Gish. I took all my favorite actresses. I took them off from the film and I played their characters. And then the last one was the Touch Retouch, which I was in love with um, the actor um, who plays in many of Bergman's film and Robert Altman. And I replaced myself to the film. So I learned also about camera movements. I learned about the, the, the decor that I had to reconstruct in order to fit into the editing in the film. And then at the end of the, the, the sort of theater, movie theater, there was the projection of these films where people could lie down on carpets and pillows and watch these films where Lula Nazarov always look young and always look uh, up to date with the different lovers she had and different films she made. And that was like the last part of Hunter experience, which really was for me very important, actually, uh, in what came after. Could, could you show number 37, Carlos? Yeah, because I can't see the, sorry, I can't see the sheet and the numbers. Well, it's when you were, um, her, your character was on um, Jimi Hendrix's girlfriend in the convertible. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I hear you... it is. We just passed it. Here it is. So this is me having fun with Jimi Hendrix. Um, <laughs> so there was a work of photography we would do to look like the same lighting that there was in the original photo and then working the graphism of the, the newspaper that you can see on the graphic. And then we would, I would reinsert myself into the photographs and reshoot it and then print those photographs for the for the fake movie theater. Without Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Very DIY. Can, may I ask you something? Oh, yes. Um, I, I, I requested that you include the touch film, the Bergman, your, your um, insertion into the Bergman film. Um, which I don't even know the date of. Was that in the show or right? It was after? in the show. It was 2001 or two. Okay. okay. Um, and at the time or previously a little bit, we, we, we knew as artists something about this thing called appropriation, right? And people had appropriated material that was in the popular culture, let's say, and manipulated it. Um, but I've always been curious that your manipulation um, from the time you were an MFA student and for me continues into the presence is this fluency you have with inserting and blurring, uh, inserting fiction into nonfiction, if you will, you know, inserting um, artifice into the actual in this seamless and uh, most engaging uh, a way. Um, and I wanted uh, your audience to see the touch because that, the artifice there is extreme. You're, you are a male character. 
your character, the fiction character, inserted into the touch is yeah, it's true. <laughs> so there's a gender switch, and and you you still had this fluency to do that, and I just um, I guess my 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 question is, were you thinking about the confluence of fiction nonfiction, or 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 what was what was the engagement for you? I mean, for me, I think it, it wasn't about thinking about gender. It was so normal and fluid to just take the space of entering cinema, entering the screen in a way to just jump into cinema in a way that I could. Um, I think I had such a desire to belong, uh, to be with um, my my passion for 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 the fiction, for for the stories, for what made me cry, what made me laugh, what uh, the imagery that I would collect also at home, which was like, like a kid who would buy, you know, all the photo stills from cinemas. Um, they told me stories all the time, the glamour, the, that was art for me. And in a way I wanted to be part of it. So there was no questioning that it was easy to jump in and anyone could. And in a way, it became yeah. my reality um, and it was more intensified as my reality and more real to me than if I had to think about creating a fiction. It became the mm. closest to the emotion to me. Yeah, and you know, at, at large, um, viewers you know, of cinema have that experience frequently, right? We, we, we kind of call it empathy sometimes right, or the identification with the story or a character or some aspect of film, so that in the experiential moment of viewing film, there's this, it's real to the extent that it's happening to the person, even though it's in front of them as a film. And I think that's a little bit what Daniel was talking about in the, in the first introduction when he was saying, I became, I mean, it's a big compliment to you, Marie, because it's exactly, what he experienced is what you experienced and what you went on to make, you know, was this invasion, if you will, of, um, of uh, one, one um, kind of real into the second kind of real um, and, and, through, and through artifice. And anyway, it's also, I wanted the, the, your viewers um, at Hunter to have the experience of the touch to see you know, how you did that at, um, you know, really early uh, in, in, in your working history and... Um, and no tools. I mean, that was like, when I right. think of how we make things today, it was like a that's great a, learning experience. <laughs> um, that's, another, that's another story and maybe we can continue it because you continue to, you know, to make um, and to use film. And I just because you mentioned that we knew each other that long ago, you know, when you were first starting out, it didn't take a genius to meet you, get to know you a little bit, and to know that you were a cinephile. <laughs> I mean, I'm much more comfortable living through, um, through fiction in my daily brain than in yeah, real yeah, life. That's a form also. You were in an MFA program trying to find a form, trying to find your work, you know, and it was apparent that your um, engagement was with the moving image and with cinema. But, but I have to say it's true that um, I had never been exposed or led to cinema or anyone guiding me to this, but in a way, I'm really happy I didn't go to film school, but I went to art school um, oh, yeah. because I wouldn't be making the films I'm making today. And I wouldn't have found this kind of fabrication and emotion that I have today in relationship to the work and the fabrication of all the work, the way it uh, visually interacts with the world and people. And I think I would be the place I found was a place of freedom because in a way there was no rules like the cinema school have a lot of rules <laughs> about how you should make films and I think by finding my own way also through the experience of living in New York uh, being in touch with the art 
world, a certain kind of art world. The underground is a beautiful underground. Like, you know, Alice in Wonderland, the real title is Alice is Underground. And I think it's a beautiful image that under the ground, there is also a, a class of poets that I had to dig and find. And that's where I felt that I could find freedom in terms of mixing medium um, and having these encounters that became portraits, uh, portraits, encounters. And I never mixed, um, I never separated living and making. And for me, that's very important also that Hunter um, being a student was also to work to pay for life and to pay for keeping making art was very important and I'm really happy I did continue to teach or curate and have also relationship to always being in the, the art being mixed with life uh, and I think that's something you also experienced and also brought to class in many ways and then the many artists I made portraits on never really separated either um, life and art and I think that's something that also created that type of work um, specifically. Yeah and, but, and there's a big subject Marie. Uh, I know I'm going in all over the places but it's <laughs> I'm stuck I'm, I'm, on Jimi Hendrix right now. <laughs> I'm not going all over the place we, we're in your company it's, it's great. <laughs> I just have to be a little nerdy uh, and bring up things like um, you, um, well, first of all, uh, Carlos, um, maybe you could um, show the number one um, image, which is Marie's first uh, portrait film, uh, her subject, uh, Richard Forum with the actor Willem Dafoe. Uh, it's the, th the first picture. Number one. So that's the Kucha brothers, the third one on the, that's Richard yeah. Forum. Uh, and you my, see William Defoe right there. Yeah. Um, my computer and, decided to do um, an, uh, some kind of crazy upload, so I no longer have an image <laughs> of the screen. Um, I can see you, Mari. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted the students to and your audience to, you know, see some of these images. So the foreman with William Defoe, who most people know because he's become, uh, you know, a well-known film actor. Um, in effect, uh, is the first portrait. Can, can we say that? Yes? Yes. Yeah. I mean, no, the first encounter, but the first portrait was on the Kuchar brothers. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. But um, until, um, or, uh, until the present, you know, that it's been a thread in, 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 the, in the work that you make something that I call portrait, so I'm happy you use the word as well, which is a very... Um, a particular <laughs> um, area in which to work that um, isn't uh, given as that obvious in, in what you said. I appreciate what you said and it's, um, and I understand it, but you came to this notion of making portraits, which and portraits became some kind of portal for you <laughs> into the many aspects of your filmmaking that are now becoming iconic, okay? And what I'm getting at, and forgive me if I kind of already said this before, but I find it of great interest that these are a kind of documentary that is your invention. And when we look at one of your portraits, I'm not just seeing documentary footage of the person and their background and pieces of their work and so on. I am having a double experience of encountering the subject, the portrait, and of every minute, at every minute, I am watching a film. Your, your films, I have this double experience, if that makes sense. I see, you know, every, I mean, we all know what it's like to look at a film and you kind of become unconscious, right? And you're just yeah. drifting along with the film and carry it. That cannot happen in watching your work. And it, <laughs> it, it's because of the camera. It's because of the editing. It's because of the flow and the sequence. And it's also because um, 
for my brain and eyes and ears, I have not seen this. So he grabs me by the throat. I have not seen the style of something that could be called a documentary where uh, this is made by an artist and the artist is all over this film as the film. I mean, it, it, it's true that it's only years later that I can call it a portrait or documentary or fiction. At the time, I had no idea what I was, I had no words for what I was uh, starting. And the way that it happened is that I was, um, I think I was so engaged with the work and the process of the creating, uh, creation of the person that would be meeting. Um, for example, the work, the, the film portrait on Richard Foreman, because I had worked with him, I had very great um, respect for his work and also we became friends. And the friendship always became also um, a work and friendship relationship that became me too. I would start also working. So the way of being together with this person was to also film them because that was what I was most comfortable with. But I was alone, always. I'm always alone when I film. There's not a crew, there's not lighting, there's not... It's, I'm alone with the person that I'm filming. I know that it takes years to make them also. It's not a one day shoot. It's a repetitive coming back to the person. It's spending time with the person. It's sharing stories. And the way I approached it was mainly to first start with the sound and recording stories, uh, sitting down, eating, drinking coffees and recording stories. And not in a chronological way or journalistic way, but more, I'm always really taken by the throat by people's stories, by people's humor, by people's uh, sound of their voices, the tonality of their voices, the way they put the words, the humor they have, a very New York way for, for, for Richard, and then after being spending time recording stories, I would also bring the camera and then not to bother the person and put the camera in their face, I would start also filming what I would like and what I see around in the house, which was, for example, for Richard is his amazing uh, book library and the little sets of his theater that were done in models uh, miniature. So this would be like more like daily, a recording of images of their lives and then I would start having to play with them because I think the playground situation was something that allowed me to also have fun with the person that I was filming um, with a friend and this playfulness allowed I think for me I found a place where something intimate and very uh, deep came because of the playfulness and the sort of fiction that was kind of set up between him or her and me. And when that was set up, something else would come that would give me a lot of excitement where I was shooting. And then another layer that came slowly also is like from the story they would tell me, it gave me imagery. So it gave me sort of tableau vivant. Um, I would see colors, I would see sets, I would see costumes. And so I would try to put it together. So I would put themselves in their own story. So there would be another layer of recreation of their own stories in my own way, in my own imagery. So there would be a sort of collaboration also between their stories and my, my way of interpreting them and then redoing them. So there was like, there's many layers of the way of approaching the filmmaking for me. And sometimes for the Richard Foreman, it took um, two years. For the film on Tony Conrad, it took five years. The film on Genesis Purity it took seven years. It's because time passes that also, I think for me, it's very important because the trust is established. And when the trust is established between the two characters, me and the other, um, something about the age, the time, the accumulation of archives gives a sort of a, an amount of work that is huge. And then I spend so much time, like a year alone editing. And for me, that's also, it's never um, written, the film is never scripted in a way. It's 
it's scripted as time goes because I know where the story might be going more, or what it, I could be missing in the story, or what I get excited that I, I have to film. And then I know when it's over, when I need to edit. And when I start editing, I start with the sound because there's much less imagery uh, than there is sound. There's much more layers of sound. And the sound is really what excites me. It's like sometimes 18 or 20 layers of sounds that becomes like composing music and recreating um, the atmosphere and cut-ups in a way. Um, it's like a collage and in a way it reminds me when I was a hunter making portraits and cutting paper and collaging to make them as animations. And in a way, years later I'm doing this, but with film, with the sound, with the music, with the imagery, with the editing, everything is combined together finally, and which is really where I feel the closest to. And it's also a love story every time. There is a relationship between me and the person. Um, it's not, I never choose to film Alan Vega, I never choose to film Tony Conrad. It's because we met and because the friendship grows and because we spend time that the film exists. I don't think I could, it would be a very different approach and a very different feeling that you would have if I had chosen to film or to make these films. Um, they would have a very different shape. Um, and to me, they're like heroes, you know, that you can spend a day with them. And even if you don't know who they are, in a way, even the strangest ones, you can get close and understand something of their process of living and creating. Hmm. Hmm. That's, yes. I was flirting around with that subject and you said it very well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to say that, um, I think it's very, um, very bold in the best sense of bold, very adventurous, very, I like the word experimental, but you know, to go into the documentary and I'm going to try to remember how you said it, that you put them and their stories into the story you're making also. You know, and that was the conf confluence that I was trying to articulate, where there are moments when we know the camera is on and it's a candid moment and you, are, you and artifice and is very little there. It's mostly there in, in sound. And then there are these other moments that are clearly, if you will, staged. And who could have staged them but the, the filmmaker? Do you know, and I think it's this very bold, exercise into the kind of construction of an identity you know and we all construct these personas and identities and the the um you know we've we've binary fiction and non-fiction in a way that simply isn't true because we are composed of fiction and non-fiction actually do you know I think, uh, I think i'm really not interested in telling the story of genesis from a to z um, no, or any of I've them. never been interested at all. I'm interested in something else that is learned between us in time and that becomes the subject and creating a third part in a way. Yes, and I, I just want to draw attention in Genesis, which everyone had, everyone had the link, right? That was a film that, that you gave as a link to everyone, correct? The Ballad of Genesis and Lady J. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just so that uh, the viewers know what we're talking about. I just want to bring attention back to you as a filmmaker and a tiny little moment in that film. That's an example of your, um, your, um, mind at work <laughs> as a filmmaker, which is when you're showing some, uh, black and white documentary, uh, footage of the uh, poet and writer Brian Geisson and Genesis is the voiceover on that film telling us a story of when she was young and she met Brian Geisson in Paris and she would go to see him and visit and he would always have her cookies her favorite cookies um, chocolate fingers and your genius for me is that then 
So it's black and white film. He's very young. He's been dead a long time. You know that's documentary footage. If you couldn't have taken it. And these shots that are edited with it are of Genesis in the contemporary moment in color film enacting eating the eating of cookies that she's talking about in her own story. So that, when you were talking about layers, that kind of layering of one documentary, the black and white visual, second documentary, her voiceover remembering her story, and then this insert of the contemporary moment, and you're having her enact a part of her story, and you've added it together. I found that really bravo. And there are moments, and there are moments of that kind of complexity throughout your work. And they don't come to us as complexity. That's why I use the word fluent, fluent with fiction and not fiction. Why am I hearing background noise? I can hear you. Like okay. I was thinking, for, maybe, for example, if I hope you've seen the uh, maybe the work of the film on Tony Conrad. In part of the film, he's um we're in the kitchen he's in the kitchen dressed in pink outfit and he's cooking um he's cooking films he's calling it no you do it you do it a number of times um carlos can you get everybody on mute so that we don't have to hear somebody yammering away much lower than the other one i don't know who's talking um ak could you put your mute on we can hear someone. It's hard to focus. Yeah. Um. Aka Burns. <laughs> there is a microphone there. <laughs> yeah, we need to get her muted out because it's it's a little difficult. Um, I'm just on my crummy laptop. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, no, no. I, wish, I wish Carlos that. I don't have a screen anymore. I just have the word Zoom. I, I, I'm wishing that while you were talking, maybe you could move through after um, um, where he gave the image number one, just start moving through number two, number three. So that we'll be talking. There's really something to Wait. No sense. Stop this person. No wonderful sense. I'm just telling you. But there's something that looks like it could possibly be something, but it's filled in in such a way. It is anything. Oh, okay, well, okay. AK Burns, could you turn off the sound? Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, maybe, Carlos, we can look through some of the images. Um, there's something that I, maybe I wanted to add uh, when you talked about film, and I think it was really very much linked to the class we had together and then the continuation of the people I met through your your guests also at Hunter, was the fact that um, when... Uh, image number two. When I started film, I, made, I wanted to make clear that thanks to the... Um, the atelier, the studio I had with a few friends uh, in Long Island City, there was, I started making film and it was on film, on 16 millimeter film. So which means it's this camera that you see right now, which is the Bolex camera, which I'm still using today, which takes a three minute reels of film, which you have to rewind every 25 seconds, which means there is no sound recorded at all when you're filming. So there's no sync sound. And I think to me was that was a huge, huge influence in the work and a huge liberation in a way, because I had to learn um, not to sync, but to create music with the sound and also be very specific in editing sound uh, with when you saw in ballad, it's like hours, years of recording, seven years of sound, and then you only have 72 minutes of maybe 40 minutes talking, which means it's nothing. So it's all about editing sound separately from filming the image. And I, that creates also something that we talked a lot about in video art and in the sound class, um, which was really essential to the filmmaking process. 
Well, you absorb something amazingly because I think the way you break the taboo of um, there's either sync sound or VO, that's it in filmmaking, you know, and the VO is the off camera voice, the sync is the person's mouth is moving and we hear what they're saying. What one of the biggest taboos that I love of yours is Genesis Peoria just speaking and her mouth is moving. I think she's in the kitchen, but you've actually synced it to something you recorded as audio. So while she's talking in the picture, what we're hearing is what she said, but not at that moment. It's and not so, the same moment, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's just this play on think sound, you know, which is, is this kind of onus on filmmakers, you know, these abiding rules of there's diegetic sound, non-diegetic, boom, that's it, you know, and that um, separation and relationship that you make between the picture and the audio over and over and over in the course of a film is another factor when I said, I just am watching and listening every second, you know, is part of that, 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 um, that richness and I had it in my mind to ask you why the hell are you so addicted to that bollocks and to film and not so-called contemporary um, technology but you answered it by saying it's, it's that. It's really this I think even when I use digital camera I film in a way that I film when I'm using film so I don't shoot too much I don't shoot constantly. It's okay. very precise when I film. So it's, I try to not think of the sound when I film because I want to be just with the image and the character or the object I'm filming. And then I like to think of the sound as a separate part so I can also displace the world that I'm seeing to create something else with the sound and the character. And to me, that's, it might not work for some people, but for me, it's a huge element of excitement oh. and of work, uh, part of the work in everything I do, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a major um, characteristic, you know, of, of, of the work. And I don't even want to call it style because it's more mindful and thoughtful and even conceptual than just a style of editing or a style of making sound. You never get fixed into you know, being a recognizable auteur kind of style. But I think, um, God, have we been yammering about this for 20 years? <laughs> Marie, sound image relationships. Yeah, we have. <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of started consoles also because I had no means. In a way, um, I didn't have people to help me. And also I had this bollocks that some nice- How are you boyfriend gave me and also I didn't have sound equipment so everything was done separately it was first as a way like I didn't think twice I had to make work so I just did it the way I could and then it, I found a way to use it but it it synced to my the body function I knew it was right for me and from yeah. that I felt very comfortable to push it even further in that direction and since it's only recent that I have been able to have a film produced or, and that doesn't mean much money but it means a little bit more help and shown um, <clears throat> all these films before was not with any concept or desire to fit into anything it was a total freedom um, which means I could use sound the way I wanted and the image the way I wanted and find my language with uniting them I would, yes, I, I would say there's a language in the film rather than the style, you know, your language. I mean, and that's another reason they're very engaging uh, to watch because one um, uh, in, um, becomes fluent in your language. You know, we can't be the habitual viewer like, oh, I know the grammar and vocabulary of filmmaking. And, you know, you can kind of be not very present watching film. Yeah. Wait, uh, Carlos, just hold for a minute with these images. So, yes, um, I mean, some people like to uh, uh, um, repeat a cliche, which is that sometimes limitations make us very creative, you know, which is a little bit what you were 
acknowledging because you didn't have any wherewithal. You know, you had one shitty little camera, you couldn't be the sound person, the lighting person. So you um, manipulated limitations, you know, into becoming um, the work that you make continuously over years with different DIY relationships to things. One of which, as we've been seeing these images, I just want to bring up how much of the film visually is yours. Often you make the costumes, you make the scenery, the settings, you, the makeup, these elements that become the highly visual, visuality uh, language uh, of your work. <laughs> But I think a, a, a part of that DIY thing that I just didn't want us to um, not um, address in this particular forum with, um, with students is um, you had to also, in a rather DIY fashion, navigate this world of independent um, filmmaking, which isn't easy. <laughs> And you acknowledged uh, that the amount of um, the time that it, you know goes into film work, three years, two years minimum, five years sometimes. Seven. And then, and then, yeah, seven. Um, and then, um, and then, and then, and then what? Do you know, what was your experience navigating both the art world, which you were very familiar with and some kind of independent film world, you know, how, how does that happen for an independent film, young independent filmmaker? I mean, I, in a concrete way, I always had a job uh, and I still do. So in a way, um, it also, that's very important because it's not, I was not waiting, <laughs> writing dossier uh, to wait for a grant to make a film. Um, that never happened to me. and. I never even thought of waiting. I think what I needed to do was just to keep making. And the person who really, really pushed me in there was the Kuchar brothers. They were the twin brothers who inspired the whole work of John Waters and who made thousands of films together as brothers. But they just made films. They made films and they said they were Sunday filmmakers. Um, I think this is the first photo on the, the Kuchar, uh, the first one, that's George Kuchar. And I thought it was really beautiful that they always told me, um, just don't worry about showing, don't worry about money, just keep working at it, keep making, and keep finding the desire to keep making, which for me was one of the best advice because I just kept making as long as I could with friends. Um, many of the friends are in the films, help making the films, trying to just always keep, you know, not having just one project and nothing else, but many others at the same time working nonstop. I mean, I love to work, but it's just, there's, that's what there is. <laughs> and this is, uh, and you have to really, really, really have faith somehow and just keep the desire. I mean, that's the key point is when you find the, the desire. It falls down, of course, but you have to work at it to get it back. But it, it, I think it's only recently that they were shown because I just kept making and then one day this woman said, wow, you've made a lot of work. Just give me some and I'll, I'll look at it. And then two years later, she calls me and I'm having all of my films screened at the Berlin Alley, and I had no idea. Um, and this really, of course, helped me then to show many, many other places and to get more grants and to get more money to make bigger or better projects in a way that I could afford. But still, you know, it, it's just, it didn't change up to today that I just, it takes a long time. It's very hard to be an independent filmmaker especially when cinemas are closed and uh, <laughs> but I mean <laughs> um, okay well I yeah it was it was the, oh yes there we go lovely lovely this is John Waters and me in the laundry room after a wonderful talk we did together last year just before the pandemic and the students were asking him all about how he made films and 
he didn't want to talk about films. He did a stand-up comedy. So then I took him to the laundry room to make a series of laundry room portraits. Um, so life... <laughs> You color coordinated in your outfits. We were dressed really similarly. Uh, uh, it was perfectly without you knowing. That purpose in, in many of your films. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've run an hour and there's, there's, there's some images and a subject, if you don't mind, that I'd like us to get to. Of Is course, do you want to go to the, the movie boxes and the artwork uh, in the gallery? Carlos, could you go to the, starting with um, the image number 12, and just start um, bringing those up on screen. Um, Here is this one, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just for, from, from my perspective a, a wee bit, you know, you have had your hands into the making of your films, not only because you still edit with film, but because you paint the walls, you make the curtains, the costumes, the makeup and so on. So there is this made by you and made by hands aspect to the work. And and recently um, you've been making um, work for exhibition. And I, I, I wanted us to, to get to that part of of your work, which um, is a little harder for us to, to see unless, um, you know, or I should say when you have a show in the city. But I wanted us to um, get to this work. So here we are. And I see it. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful because it's very recent that I have a gallery in Paris, a woman who really picked me out. I didn't go to meet her, she met me, and that was the best part. And it's been okay. really wonderful to create. These were the costumes that were used for one of the recent films I did with Felix Kubin. Uh, so they were exhibited as theatrical. I reproduced the way I make film as a set for the the elements of the films. And many, if you continue, Carlos, we will see the movie box. Oh, these, are, you can see a movie projector here, which, um, well, we'll see another one. Here's the curtains that is all handmade with uh, drawings in oil paint. And there's a lighting, when you're outside, you see inside, but at night, uh, you have lighting in the gallery, so you can, on you can see uh, the eyes as uh, movie monsters from the outside and from the inside you can see people. Um, so it's always a game of vision um, between the eyes. And the eyes is what, you know, goes through the eye lens for me all the time. Uh, and if you continue the slides, so these are the movie boxes. They're, they're the size of um, a little bit bigger than my head. and. There, I use all of the outtakes of the film, so the pieces of the film I did not edit uh, in the feature film or the short films. I love so much making them and there are so many pieces that are not fitting in the story of the film, but they're fitting in terms of a loop or telling another story. For example, here is a friend, um, Elina Lowenson, an actress, who is behind an aquarium because I use a lot of uh, silent film effect to make films like behind an aquarium you put two lighting you put glitters you put your hand in it and you look it looks like the character is stuck in the water and there's a giant wave of glitters going in there and she's stuck so i made these movie boxes that are like the beginning of apparatus of cinema they are like the old style cameras or movie boxes or stereoscope and so i play with these kind of stories and they become also objects because she's a bird in the movie so the box becomes part of the birds as well then there's another one this one is a self-portrait and when you look through the eyes you can see a film the first one of the first film i made when i xerox my face um, at my lunch break at my job and i used the free Xerox machine until I got caught and I made my first animations. Then there's another movie box um, that's Felix Kubin and these are outtakes where he's a, a, a musical conductor and I wanted him to be a musical conductor for birds and I had met this animal trainer. Um, 
it was very expensive to train the animals, so I couldn't afford it. And he said, listen, Marie, I give you the birds for one day for free. But of course, they didn't do anything I wanted. They were not listening to what Felix was doing. So it's all kind of fucked up scenes with the birds, but they were so beautiful. So I made these boxes in homage of the one day bird day. And these are the food that the birds are were spitting out and eating that I put into the box. So then you have, uh, uh, these are cakes that I made out of um, plastic. And they're like uh, soft uh, plastic. And then the top one is a real cake. It's like a Chinese cake full of cream and butter. And on it, I'm projecting this film that I made called Eat My Makeup, which is a film where we're having a pie fight on top of rooftops in New York City with George Kuchar. And so the, after one month of being in the gallery, the cake starts smelling and rotting. And you can see that people have put their fingers to check it's a real cake. So the cake in the film starts having another conversation with themselves. And I really like that. Um, <laughs> um, then you can see portraits that I still do, oil paint on rice paper with friends. Friends who are in my movies. This is Jivko. This is my cameras. I made a series of paintings of cameras for Ilo Halloween. This is my Hall Halloween um, camera. It's a bloody one. This is another style, Super 8 camera with my hands. Uh, this is another friend, a filmmaker, Patrick Shia. Uh, this is another insertion, photos from Hunter, where I'm with Humphrey Borgarten, the producer, insertion. <laughs> This you can see there is like an aquarium and I put a film underneath where there is another outtakes of a film where people are like using their hands to try to get out of the aquarium, but it didn't work in the film. So I used it in a real aquarium. And then another piece of the Felix film. This is a piece I did in, for, in New York, a scopy tone machine. And the scopy tone were the first um, jukebox. It's like a music machine. But when you press the button, you have the music and the film at the same time. So it was really very camp film. So the film was made with just friends and Genesis Purage, and we just did a very funny music video. And when you press that button, the film would start and the music would start. This is a movie set with the film screen between painted arcades of um, paintings from theater and uh, photo lights and movie boxes in a gallery recently. Fondation Ricard, you see close up of different boxes with films in it. And this is a giant wall of um, oil paint that are very much many layers of, um, of a character who is uh, pregnant of movie cameras and film and who is giving birth to a film which is being projected live with a film that I did in animation that is um, the 16 millimeter projector screen the heads of all the people I'm putting out of my belly in a way. <laughs> really nice. I really so you have also the sound in the gallery of the projector which is very loud and driving everyone nuts but it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great um, combined media. <laughs> old, old technology, not old technology. I really wanted us to get to that because, you know, I don't want to be symmetrical, over symmetrical, but um, you did start um, your engagement with art and film at Hunter, um, do you know, and I sometimes. Um, seeing this gallery work, which you've occasionally done in the past, and this work, you know, I see evidence of the advantage, if you will, of having not been ghettoized into um, a filmmaking curriculum or a filmmaking department, school, you know, whatever, and navigating through um, the uh, visual arts and film, and in your work over and over again, importantly, music and sound. 
Um, I, I really want to know if the students have questions for you. So I was thinking that we could jump ahead, um, Carlos, down to um, um, maybe starting with 63 through the works in progress and Maria and I could just talk a little bit or I could just start Marie by reminding the viewers that the because you were so eloquent about working with sound oh dear uh say this is Constance <laughs> and Tony Conrad one of our Constance's dearest friend of mine so you have a whole list of photos that are photos taken on with friends who are in the films who are very dear friends but also the whole family of friends and uh, no. film stills taken during the shoots of films. So you can see as we talk or you have questions, you can see photos taken during the filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and often these are um, at moments when, when, when you're working with your friends, like that particular image of Tony and I, we were actually, we were just on camera for something. Um, so- You're working you know, with Tony Ausler, who was- yeah. Filming with, <laughs> with, with Murray and music, everyone. Um, of course, you know, Throbbing Gristle and um, Genesis Pjord. Um, this is Alan Vega, with whom um, Murray worked. She's currently um, working with the residents, who I know is a beloved uh, music cult for, for many of you. And here um, they are. <laughs> well, Here's two residents and two, I don't know who those other. And two New York residents and two residents. <laughs> yeah, um, and so this, um, I don't, I just wanted to, you know, to bring that up in case um, um, it wasn't clear when you were talking about sound that this, um, oh dear. Um, this is Peaches, which, you know that that your that your um, your ongoing for twenty years working relationship and personal relationships, you know, have navigated across. In particular, I would say um, music, the visual arts, and filmmaking. Um, I think I'm right in saying that. Um, You've yet to pay any attention to writers and writing, darling. I don't know. I'm so bad at it. That's why I love your work so much also. I admire that part. <laughs> so, Carlos, maybe we can... Um, oh, yeah, well, this is Mari at, at work um, with the uh, residents and Tony Arsler. And um, to this day, yeah, one, one person... Um, I, mean, I guess... I I guess you should say what's going on, Marie. You're making a film with us. I mean, I'm making a film with you guys. I think what we see in these photos that is important also to me and very dear to my heart is that I, I think the way I feel making art to me is also creating a family and completing constantly, working really hard at um, playing. Um, and situations that puts together uh, something very serious, really hard work, but also the playfulness of putting also people, for me, people together who I know have something that they share, but creating situations that provokes um, surprises. And I think it's these moments of surprises that creates pure freedom for me and discrepancy that excites me and where I find where the cut up, uh, where the energy and the musicality of life becomes recorded into making films um, or any kind of elements of art. And often I don't know what I'm doing, but I find it slowly. I lack confidence, but it comes back by playing. Here I'm playing again with Tony Ausler who came to Paris. This is making a portrait and it's always playing with simple things, uh, low means, but it's creating situations that vibrate. This is a photo from the shoot where I'm doing portraits on the residents. And it's very difficult to make a film on people who are masked. So how to invent 
making a film with emotions, with feelings, when you don't see the face of the person. So stripping the mask is another story. <laughs> Okay, so now we're down through the, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm being the bossy foreman, okay, for a second. Yes, I think maybe <laughs> it's so hard to speak just with a screen and not seeing all the students and everyone. Yeah, so maybe bring your viewers um, into uh, perhaps view and uh, into conversation if, if um, somebody in, in either hearing um, Marie today or having looked at the, uh, the films we gave you links to, if you, um, you know, if there's a question or comment or input of, you know, any kind from someone. Uh, I want to jump in uh, and I'll let, of course, the students ask questions. I just have like one burning thing that came from this, such an amazing, rich conversation. Thank you. But uh, uh, Marie, one thing that you actually started saying and then something with technology didn't work, so it kind of got interrupted. I thought you were talking about that. But uh, what I mean is like a, in Tony Conrad's film, there is one moment when he is kind of pickling films and the 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 basically the, the screen is divided in two so you have two Con Tony Conrad's, one of them washing and the other one boiling with the, like coughing at the smoke and all that. And they're connected by the string of the, the film. This be, I mean, that's like a, such an amazing moment. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious on a purely kind of like um, on a yes. kitchen level, you know, how did you, uh, you know, how did you arrive at that idea then uh, in the process of you, you guys playing together? What was that moment? How did you get to it? Well, we thought about it together because at this moment, Tony was like, oh, look, if he showed me in his kitchen, nothing was working uh, well. So if you lift the cover of the gas thing, you could actually put things in thing. And so the image was created that I would put tape on half of the film, shoot one part of Tony doing one part of the screen and then rewind the film in the camera, change the tape to the other side of the lens and reshoot. So we'd have two Tony on the same segments of film in camera doing the two actions of developing and drying the film at the same time, which was the two activities he had to do to make the pickle film. But I, we thought it would be really great if he was doing it all at the same time. So with the old style of like sort of sound and film effect uh, magic, you could do two images in one on one screen um, together. Yeah. Over, it's an example of um, over and over again in your work, uh, not repetitively in, in, in style or in content, but these um, Marie Lossier special effects, you know, that are just made from dirt. <laughs> you know, they're just made by, this I, actual, like what you described about the woman, the face through the aquarium, and then you throw in things into the water. And this is a in made in real time special effect. And there's no post production to all the films you saw except the yeah. Felix Green. Um, One of the no mixing. There is no special effects on any kind. It's always and that's the fun part for me is to make these together. As and, you're making. And for your viewer, um, I'll just take that perspective, you know, as your viewer, um, it doesn't read like, oh, a special effect, you know, yeah. which we are inundated with and have been since the 80s, you know, and since the 80s, the, the, the visual quality of a lot of special effects um, has that particular um, saccharine kind of not always, I'm exaggerating, there's some fabulous ones, but yours, from my perspective, uh, because I've not seen them ever, that's not a special effect or in the vocabulary of special effects that, you know, have been seen. I always find them very fetching, you know, mm -hmm. and my eyes get, you know, wide open by seeing something I haven't, I haven't seen before. Even, you know, if I know what it is you're doing is just smoke and mirrors, um, it, it's still effective. And I think, um, 
are they're very eyes. naive in a way they're not you know they remain very like naive exciting childish effect on me uh in order to make them the way they are yeah, maybe but i don't know what makes childish i mean maybe animatronics is childish maybe you know um what we've taken to be uh the main uh critical mass of um so-called special effects. Maybe that's very childish. I, I, I wouldn't use that word. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it qualifies. I think your special effects are very thoughtful and um, engaging and, and um, um, you used your head to make them, you know? It's not just messing about. <laughs> I mean, for you, experientially it may be. Um, but anyway, I'm a word nerd, sorry. <laughs> no, and I'm really bad with words. So. <laughs> but anyway, do do any people have questions or comments? There, there are questions uh, I can hear in the chat here. They're not questions. People want to ask a question. So, Carlos, uh, do we uh, do we unmute? Oh, here we go. That, so everybody wow. can do that by themselves. Sorry. Go go on, Anna Sophie. Sorry. Thank you. Um, hi, Marie. Thank you so much you. for joining us. It's so wonderful to have you here. Uh, thanks for making so much beautiful and amazing work. Merci. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about like uh, your like choices of medium, and um, I sort of like through, throughout like my relationship with your work, it becomes more clear to me that I feel like your medium is is empathy. I I want to hear I want to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> I feel like 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 throughout your work it's um like that that seems to be like this sort of like a driving force uh in terms of like making making work with with people who are in your life and uh, collaborating with people that you have a relationship to and I mean I really have to say everything that's been done is um, provoked in a way by encounters and um, it's completely unexpected sometimes and sometimes it feels like we were expecting each other uh, and the friendships um, is really what becomes the the energy the love a sort of love that creates the desire to uh, to create and I think that's the drive number one that I have to be honest with making any of the work and also I, 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 I love these people in a way that these friends that um, I want to make a film a sort of um, homage the best I can also to, to their work, to who they are and they become sort of kind of heroes of my own fiction or heroes of my own films. Um, I think uh, some of them you, I mean, it might not be their real stories. Some wants to invent their own stories through the making, but there's some grounds of um, desire on both parts, I think, in order to make these films happen. Uh, I think it's also the person that I film who also desires somehow to join the adventure um, of being so close that we can also create these images together in these stories hmm. yeah i i feel like uh, like your work you the work you did way you were encompassing this fictional character of like lola and nazareth that is it's also like this this kind of like an expression of extreme empathy like being able to uh, uh to like to take over this other this other person's life um I feel like it's, it's also that. I wanted to say to what uh, Constance was saying, maybe your, your special effects, they are not uh, childish, they are childlike. Like watching wow. your work, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's like watching, a, a, it's like, kid, like a kid's TV show or something. It's, it's, I was thinking more about the, the, the need to play, uh, whatever level that means, but uh, the engagement into playing is that for me allows this kind of freedom to create something else. Um, so that's where the word came in my head, on, at least. Um, 
because like Tony, for example, is always ready to play. I feel like there's, I mean, Tony's always, um, there's always creation, a piece of garbage is becoming a piece of art in five minutes and then uh, cooking is playing and art and then sleeping and jumping on beds is art and everything becomes invention. Oh, I love this Constance. You see, she plays all the time. <laughs> Tony's garbage that he made as a sculpture birthday present. Oh, I love this. I have one somewhere too. Yeah, these are desiccated um, bananas. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> I wanted the three of us, uh, if I may, Anna, Anna Sophie, mm -hmm. um, because uh, in, in, in responding to you, um, I think also Marie brought in something uh, that matters to me uh, and that I appreciate in the work, which is bringing nuance and uh, meaning and even value to artifice. Um, artifice is often sequestered off as not real, not authentic, not true, you know, not the truth. And we're in this, it has been, and it comes and goes. There's cinema verite comes and goes, where like we're after the truth, make it real, you know, identity politics, reveal who you are. Well, we're we're, we're many things, you know. And artifice, I mean, we're made of many parts. Um, and so many of Marie's portraits are people who have clearly constructed their identities and their personas as much as their work, you know. And I think the way in perhaps empathy or interest that Marie engages that in high level artifice that is so um, con uh, convincing as a kind of real is something I real I very much appreciate as a viewer. Um, I get very uh, bored with and tired of us thinking we know what real is, that we know what truth is, that we know it is what it is is. You know, and somebody who is so fluent with artifice, uh, as you are, it's not a given. Um, I, I think delivers um, a, a nuanced um, composition of elements that makes something real, if that makes sense. For example, I know when I was filming with Genesis, if you've seen the ballad of Genesis and Lady J, um, I, Jen always had a lot of stories. Um, I, I knew some stories sounded really not real to me in a sense, you know, sometimes you react to things, you're like, what? Um, but I didn't care because I thought it was so beautiful that she was inventing a life she needed to invent also because mm -hmm. she built all her life different characters to be Genesis Purish, to be... Um, performance artist from this part, then the, the wife and husband of Lady J and all these different bodies. And I think it was about the body and she never lied about her, the body. And I think to me, I went full hearted to the truth of what she needed to, or wanted mm -hmm. to give as a character for the film, which is yes. also what she was giving to other people. No, it's very brave, you know, because she does the Hitler mustached guy who's complaining <laughs> about being a guy all the way up to breast augmentation, through androgyny, um, through Lady J's death. And um, I know that was a long and hard film to make, but um, it's really a gem, you know, and thank you. Thank you Maybe for I, it. I have to stay through making all these for sure, sometimes it's, it's very, very hard to make. Um, there were many times I was wondering what I... I love the person so much, but I was wondering what I was doing because I was also putting my whole life in danger also sometimes. Yeah, collaboration is challenging. <laughs> flash, flash of Titan-sized... Uh... I can see Bradley Ayers and Lily who are very much collaborators in my life and my art and many of my films were right there. Hi, Marie. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, 
I, I'm sorry, I still want um, people to understand that this is an opportunity to talk with questions. And, and if you have something, just even an observation, it's, it's, you know, we don't have to abide by, oh, it's toward the end of the program, we will now have a q and A. I mean, maybe you have an observation as not a question per se, or... Um. Hey, Marie, so happy to see you here. <laughs> we're sitting on the bench and near the studio outside. And we were like actually holding an umbrella earlier because it was raining. <laughs> <laughs> That's an observation. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. so, any students, yeah. Is there any students who want to step forward? <laughs> um, uh, actually, two questions. Um, so, yeah, first was that um, I like I really like the you know the playfulness of your film, and I think it, the the cut the edit the cut and it, to me it's very rhythmic it's very musical and the sound of it it's also like really surprised me it's always bring bring out so much mood. Um, and uh, my question is actually about, I want to hear those uh, frustration moments, say like when you want to play with the uh, artists that you're shooting, but then when it becomes like maybe they're not engaging with the idea and when, how this become, how, how to resolve this, if you can give us uh, one or two examples, like when, when you know, your idea didn't get transferred or maybe the footage didn't captured as your original thought and then how that the like uh, Constance was talking about the limitation how the limitation becomes another creative part and I want to hear some examples yeah um, um, sometimes it doesn't work at all I have an idea or the persons the, the friends I'm filming is giving me this um, background of an idea and we try to shoot it and it just doesn't work. It doesn't take uh, shape. Uh, but it's never lost for me because it's from that that doesn't work. Something different comes or simpler or this place that suddenly takes shapes. So I, sometimes I think it's a great idea. I want to do something and it just really doesn't work. But I don't take it as a as a failure or something, I just try something else. It, it never, I never abandon. Uh, I just try to find other cracks. Um, maybe there was one time I really, really gave up uh, because it didn't felt right, uh, is when I was filming with Peaches and suddenly I felt the relationship strangely change because I felt that she was um, expecting, uh, she was wanting too much suddenly to be a film made on her. Um, so the costume would be her friend and, and I wasn't interested in documenting uh, her life at all. Um, so I stopped having interest in a way in, um, in making the films, it changed directions. And instead of forcing it because I felt it was wrong for me and I was losing interest, then I just stopped for a while. And uh, now seven years passed and we're gonna finish it. But I think it needed that time maybe um, to also make other films and her to live something else to gather again. Um, but I felt this was a failure at the time to me. Um, but somehow it comes back. So I think that's a good example. Mm. Thank you. And I, I have another question. Is that, um, is that um, like all these artists, I feel like most of them have certain just like, like a similar char character. They're like kind of very performative. And they are already a character that could, you know, like you just put the camera there, they are very performative and they will play with you and in a lot of ways. I'm wondering if you 
are curious or ever saw the film someone is you know like not like kind of shy or uh, maybe not easy to get along with has a strong personality like some artists like that to like to do a documentary with them like someone may hard to be play, like to play with you or yeah, I think there is, I mean, if the desire, the encounter is there, I always want to. And I give you the example of Richard Foreman, who hated to be filmed. There's almost none of him in the film. So since he was so shy and so dry and so limited in, in performing, he would just sit and stare at me and not move. And it was disaster. So... I went at night in the movie, in the theater where he was performing and I asked the actor if they would do things for me that I could, you know, stage with them. So they were like, yeah, let's do that. So then that's how I made the film is that he was there just sitting and staring and most of the film is the set and the actors and then he appears. Um, but I, it was to, it was very, discouraging at first and then I, you find how how you can tell the story with other kinds of approach visually. Uh, I want to interject here for, for a second. We have time for a couple more questions. We need to be being kind of, uh, I'm, I'm slightly, um, you know, worried about Maurice like late night kind of uh, after something so intense. And so let, let's... Uh, uh, I see Alina. Yeah, uh, Alina uh, next, and then Jessica has some kind of his own line to ask a question, and we'll probably end it there unless something else. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and Alina, if I may, Marie, Alina is a MFA uh, student, yes, and very involved with um, an alliance that the students have formed called the Moving Image Alliance and they screen films and have online Zoom conversations after everyone That's has great. seen them. So Alina is very involved in that. Yeah, and one of the studio visits we would like to do is with you so that you meet with a group in That's one sure. of your- That's yeah, great. So, okay. So together, together with me, there's Anna Sophia, who also asked the question, and Lola, whom you know, and also another student whose name is Simon Benjamin, who I think is quiet because he's in Jamaica, so I'm not sure um, what's his Wi-Fi connection. But um, and we'll work with Daniel and with Anthony Howley and with AK. So I just oh, wanted to. Um, I didn't know yeah. all the people involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's like a, it's a little, you know. Um, it's a Hunter College Cine Club. Yes, um, yes, we started working in quarantine hit and we, that was like the best thing for me that happened, you know, um, as a result of, of this, you know. Um, but my question was, it's, it's maybe a very obvious question, but I am occupied with it. And I think with your work, it kind of, it really, really, um, it was like a catalyst to think about it again. Um, in your portrait films, there is a tremendous softness. Um, the, everyone who is, you know, filmed, um, I'm talking, you know, especially Cassandra and Felix, they just appear to be so soft and the the work is also there's so much softness and when you're that soft it's like you're a little bit out of your shell and um which is incredible but in the world of art where you know um there's there's problems with budget and there's also so much criticism coming or there's so much you know living in New York making in New York you've been living in New York for so long and I'm sure Paris is Paris is also not all you know um it's so, not soft. <laughs> but this softness I guess my question is how do you maintain this how can you trust that this softness will will hold will will carry everything um how yeah 
because being being tough is much easier, I suppose. Well, um, I mean, for example, Cassandro is one of the hardest person also I've ever worked with. <laughs> it's yeah. not a soft uh, world that surrounds him. It's one of the hardest one, the border of uh, El Paso and Juarez. It's full of death. It's full of war. And I think um, he's very tender. He's a very soft person but also a very very violent one too and i think the softness comes from maybe me in the sense of desiring to create an artwork where i can stop a moment and dream and i think the films have this this world uh where the maybe what constance was talking about with the um, the playfulness can also stop a moment of life is hard. So for me, sometimes where I find myself the closest to the emotion is where humor or is, which sometimes the humor comes from the deepest pain. Um, so I think that's the place where I find myself. It's hard to work with, but that's the place I find myself um, the closest to what feels um, true uh, to the right, right, um, you know, f to how to make work. I, I don't know how to respond in any other way because there's not um, a recipe at all to, uh, to what you call softness, <laughs> uh, which maybe is also, um, kind of a stop moment in time where it's also not, it's, it's not violent yet it creates, uh, it talks about very hard things sometimes. Um, what Cassandra is dealing with is pretty intense. Um, is that what you were asking? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I also think we can't, we, we, you know, Marie makes an important um, brings uh, something important into your question, which is the content and of her work, not just the subject matter, but the content. You know, Genesis Pura drew on a Hitler mustache and stood up and screamed uh, uh, against the culture about the identities that were put on to him as a man, as a woman. Um, Cassandro is shown again and again in this very difficult environment and having every bone in his body broken. Do you know what I mean? I, I um, Conrad is very intense. I mean, I don't experience um, uh, softness, <laughs> especially a dichotomy to something you said, like it's easy to be hard. Um, I, I think there's content in Marie's work uh, yeah, that if, if you let it, if you uh, relate to it as content, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's difficult. I mean, here's this gay guy, you know, being the, the Mexican border, you know, wrestling champion. I, I don't think there's a lot of loneliness also in this. There's, there's a heartbreak in that film when you show him sitting out there outside his house with this desert of... You know, very poor. Um, yeah. Even Tony, yeah. there's something really sad or lonely. Um, something. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not quibbling, uh, Alina. Forgive me. I just want to be in conversation about the idea of softness. That um, I, from my perspective, uh, you know, is what is what I'm speaking. You were speaking from yours, and I'm just, you know, participating with another perspective. Um, because those hard and tragic and difficult and so on um, elements of, the, of Marie's content is just all over the place. I think maybe it's it's closeness that I'm talking about. It's closeness. It's, um, and you mean the closeness to me and the person? We get to we get to be close to the person. Ah, I we get to we get to we get to see them as they're being in the bath naked mm -hmm. as they have physical pain and 
answers and they're crying. So that's what I mean by softness. Okay. Kind of intimacy almost. Uh, and that, right? A kind of closeness and intimacy. And intimacy. That's, mm. Yeah, that's where Daniel, um, Daniel's opening remarks about Marie's work were, were his perspective and version of that. Were you with us, Alina, when that was going on? Of course, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. I can't see. <laughs> I couldn't see who was here, or I chose not to. So, but you know, it, it, it yes. And, and I called it by my words, you know, that I'm like riveted every second in, 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 in but anyway, yeah, it's that intimacy. And, um, um, the, the, the process that we shared with us, you know, like all these years, all this filming, hours and hours going back with these difficult people and gardening. Um, I don't know, they got, they so, kind of trust in a way, uh, you know, their trust for, for, for you because... Um, but you have to be really stubborn because they often, the trust is there, but then you have to run after them or you have to sometimes, it's really tough. Like, yeah, yeah. they lie or they disappear or you have to be insistent or... And then you feel like in a horrible situation, but I'm not gonna give up because I just want to do it. It's too much of my heart in it. So you just hold on to it. Even if, you know, sometimes you feel like a horrible person to call 10 times the person. Yeah, that's really important, Marie. It's well said because like, it's not like this notion of earning trust is a bit of a cliche. and. And you have been incredibly stubborn and insistent and waded back into these very difficult, you know, situations. Um, and, um, and, but I think and also everyone is so complex and, and a lot of the people that I think I'm attracted to or that I attract also are very, they're not linear. It's very complex to understand the different levels of um, of how they function. So it's also this freedom and this kind of openness uh, that I find also very rejoicing because it's it's extremely vital and uh, enriching to me. So then, yeah, you have to be really stubborn in a way that it doesn't matter because at the end, if it's meant to be, it happens. If it's not, then you just know and you give up and you you find another road, but uh, it's about the as long as the desire is there, um, I think you just, you you feel right. Yeah. Thank Can you, I that's, think that's think great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Carlos is reminding me that we're pushing towards two hours. So yeah. I suggest we, we have like a one more question final because uh, Jesse uh, uh, Ellis has been waiting for a while. And, sure. and is that okay, Marie? So, of course, and, of course. Okay. Uh, Jessica, your turn. Hi. Hello. We can't hear your sound. Um, it's muted. Good. You have to put your sound on. Oh, my. Oh. Uh, Jessica, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, Carlos. Fingers, okay. Do you want to write it and maybe Daniel can read your question? Hi, okay. Jess. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Ah, uh, but we can't hear you. I'm sorry. We can't hear you. Jessica knows how to. Um, Unmute and mute. She must be having a problem. Can um, you can you write a version of the question quickly, or is it hard to? Yeah. Okay. It's worth waiting for another minute. Of course. Uh, uh, and I want to um, to say to everyone who still has a minute that Constance wrote and worked on a book on Tony Conrad that is incredible. That is being out soon, Constance. You're gonna do something with Hunter as well. It's uh, yeah. The book. The book has launched, 
you know, this March, since March interruption has made me a little wonky on time. <laughs> uh, it launched right before then, and some of the students know that. And I tried to litter the building of 205 with some copies. And um, this um, alliance, this media, no, Moving Image Alliance, um, is hosting Tony Conrad's films. And um, I hope people won't be sick of me, but it's not until December um, that then I, since, um, since we, Tony has left us, um, I, I will do the um, conversation and Q&A. And um, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to get copies of that book in, in, you know, into the building and so on. And an essay I wrote for the catalog of um, the, were you in the United States, Marie, to see the Tony Conrad the big um, kind of retrospective at Albright Knox and in, no, you, you were away. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's happening in December. You should is, not miss it. And, you know, while I'm waiting, but at any time, please interrupt me. Um, you know, since I brought in a number of times about your fluency with artifice and the melding of so-called fiction and so-called nonfiction and all, um, and that I saw you always as, as a cinephile of sorts, um, that there are a few people um, who might fit in the same room with you um, mentally, so to speak, with film, uh, sisters and brothers. And, and one of them, um, I don't know if the students know, who you know very well, Guy Madden. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. It was like a revelation for me in New York when his films came out at Film Forum and I was able to see them and I thought, wow, someone who is obsessed with silent film but who makes films commercially today with friends and actresses who are quite famous, like Isabella Rossellini, and who is able to make crazy films um, who are released in the theater and produced. And I thought this was like a great key for me to opening of like how you can actually use the past and use certain techniques and use certain kind of uh, production ways to make films today that have a, an effect on a, a talk conversation on today's cinema. And when I met him, it really felt right. And the first thing he did was a film where the film was screen and what was live was the sound. And it was made by Foley's artist. So it, yeah. it asked, added the layer of performance of sound and performance of bodies and objects. And I thought, this really was a huge key to like, for me, it was a very inspiring moment to, uh, to see that contemporary cinema could be also using um, uh, this kind of also non-narrative way of telling stories and sound and performance together and be released in film forum and ink and center and different other kind of layers than the underground cinema. Um, and it was wonderful to meet him and learn about also his obsessions and his where he came from. Uh, I didn't I didn't know that, that that you know there had been a meeting. I don't want to group you with a bunch of you know. Um, it's just it's just not necessary. But I, he did come to mind as a filmmaker. So if if um, if people um, if 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 you don't know, we're talking about Guy Madden. M-A-D-D-E-N. I wonder if there are other people we've been talking about that aren't known. Everyone knows Alan Vega, right? Suicide, um, Genesis Peorage, Robin Grissel. Um, you introduced Cassandra and um, what's his name? The sound person in the film and the residents. Everyone knows the residents, right? I don't want us to have been jabbering about things that um, aren't clear. But if you don't know, I can send a list and you could uh, research because they're all related somehow <laughs> to really a New York. <laughs> having, a list will, having a list will be fantastic. And oh, the, I wish it, sure. 
and the links are still there for for everybody to know for another day or so you know so if one hasn't seen something you know still time to catch up tonight or tomorrow morning last question by jessica ah okay so I'm you going got to it. read it and then we, uh how do you find the social balance between being a participant and an observer in the work does the social dynamic change when you're behind the camera since you already have a relationship with your subjects when you mean social um social relationship means the relationship with the person the uh, the way jessica is saying is social balance how do you find the social balance between being a participant and an observer in the work what does it mean exactly social balance i'm not sure i understand uh let's see if she can <laughs> um jessica how I am with the person when I'm not on the camera, when I am in behind the camera, or? Uh, yeah, uh, the second part of the question is, is that, does the social dynamic change when you're behind the camera since you already have a relationship with your subjects? Yeah, and Jessica said yes, exactly. What, what you said is, okay. yeah, um, your reading is, yeah. Well, it changes not much because I think I'm the same. Uh, <laughs> Uh, except I, you know, I usually try to direct them in one way or another, or I catch something I like, so I say, continue, continue, do this more and more. So it's kind of a, I give them orders sometimes, so I'm, I'm very serious and like not fun, uh, but in a way it's fun for them because they're being filmed and they're happy like I do the best shot of them. So I think it doesn't change that much. It's just work. Um, before or after it remains just work. Um, for me, I never think if it's better before or after, it's always just, I love shooting. It gets so exciting. So I get in trends. Wow. I think this is a great note to, to kind of <laughs> conversation. Because it's really a flaw. It's not even, uh, you can't even interrupt it. That's the, the sense I'm getting. And, and uh, I can't thank you enough, Marie and Constance, for a very rich conversation and it's like tapped into something very important and deep and very important for us to all to hear as artists. So I hope, uh, I hope it were, I was okay because I, it's, it's the screen and I wish I was uh, physically involved with all of you and I hope it didn't go all over the place, but I'm very thankful Constance brought me back <laughs> to tracks and reformulated sometimes very much better what I could say. And I really thank you, Daniel, for hosting us with Judith. And thank you. Thank name. I want to thank you very much and very interesting and you were very real and accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't wait to see the students and work with you. Yeah, the first studio visits on October 22nd. I'm sending the, the final last list with that. So looking forward yeah, to yeah. hearing about it. Thanks again Thank to everybody. Thank you so much, Constance. Oh, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. And Daniel and Judith and Eve and everyone who's in the room somewhere. Yeah, 